Hey y'all, what is up? I'm Taylor, and if you're new here to the channel, welcome. And I'm a software developer here living in Texas. Today, I'm gonna to be talking to you about the top three reasons why you shouldn't become a software developer in 2021. All right, before I start talking about it, I just wanted to show you guys the babies. Oh, look at them, they are so cute. They are just sleeping. Oh, oh my gosh, they are so cute. Okay, so today we're gonna to be talking about three reasons why you shouldn't become a software developer in 2021. Oh my gosh, camera, tilt, 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 there we go. Okay, now this is gonna be kind of hard because I recently did a video on the top three reasons why you should become a software developer in 2021. So let's just cover some of the negatives and you should take these into considerations. These are just my opinions. So do what's best for you and you know, have your own opinion on this stuff. Without further ado, let's get into my top three reasons. Okay, reason number one. Sorry, had to get my water. Ah, okay, stay hydrated, you know? Reason number one, stressful interviews. The interview process for software engineering jobs is, I'd say, more stressful than most jobs. Typically, it's a three-phase interview process. So phase one is you get a call from HR and they kind of talk to you, you know, see what your interests are, and it's just like a very casual conversation. And then phase two is a senior engineer or an engineering manager calls you on the phone and talks to you and just kind of goes over like high level of what you know and if you have any questions or anything like that, just kind of gets to know you. And then phase three is the in-person interview where you actually go in and have a one-on-one -on -one conversation with an engineering manager. Sometimes there's a senior dev accompanying them, so it might be like two engineers. And then that's where they ask you more technical questions. You'll do whiteboarding questions. And also they get a chance to like actually see you and talk to you and get to know you in person. Now with the virus, that is obviously changed. So typically instead of a actual in-person interview, you might have like a Zoom call or something where it's one-on-one, -on -one, you can see the other person. This, the interview process is like very stressful. Let me tell you about a time I had a phone interview that went really bad. Just all the worst possible combinations of events were just accumulating and this was just one of the worst phone interviews I've had. I got a call from a company that I applied to. This was a senior year of college, so I'm applying to like my first job kind of thing. So it's already really stressful because I want to make a really good impression right out of college. So this company calls me and I'm talking to a senior engineer and he's asking me questions, but at the same time, there is a thunderstorm happening this day and the phone reception is bad. Also, because of the rain, there was a leak in my roof in my apartment. So there was like water dripping down in the living room. I had a bucket and it was catching the water. This apartment was just so shitty. Like there was like cockroaches all the time throughout the apartment, no matter what we did, we put traps out, still couldn't clean up the cockroaches. So like it was a very stressful living environment. And with the, with the leak in the roof and the thunderstorm during this interview, it was just really bad anyway we were talking and I was having to ask him to repeat the question like two or three times because the reception was cutting in and out. Also, he had a pretty heavy accent, which made things even more complicated to understand. So I was asking him to repeat the question until I understand the question fully. And then I gave my answer. And after all of it was done, he was like, okay, well, thanks for the interview and we'll call you back. So I hung up and I just felt terrible like i felt like i blew the whole thing um i was so down like i just wanted to cry it was it was so bad because i thought i completely blew it um so then afterward the very next day i emailed hr for that company and i was like hey like i want to i want to get an opportunity to do this interview over again because of like the rain the situation like i explained that it was just it was just poor circumstances and I didn't feel that I was in the right mind to have a 100% interview. So I sent that email and I just waited because I was like, I have no idea what's gonna happen. This is my first time sending an email asking for a do-over in an interview. Like, I don't even know if this is gonna fly. So I got an email about a week later and HR got back to me and they were like, hey, like, 
the senior engineer really thought you were impressive and he really liked your skill set. So we want to extend you an offer. And I was, I was like, what, like how, like that, that is, that is crazy. But at the time I had already accepted an offer at another company. So I respectfully emailed back and I was like, Hey, like, thanks. But I already accepted another offer. That was a really good learning experience because it taught me that, you know, if like conditions aren't right, or if there's some circumstances that are beyond your control and the interview just doesn't go well because of those circumstances, like you can totally request to do it over. Like there was no problem with that. And I'm actually, I actually learned something requesting that redo. So that was really cool. And also it's best to repeat the question of an interviewer if you don't understand the first time. That way you're not like BSing them and you get a full understanding of the question and you can answer as best to your ability. Even if you don't know, like if you don't understand the question, get it repeated, then you understand it, but you just don't know the answer then just be honest. You don't know the answer, it's fine. Just don't BS the interviewer, they will know. It's just never good to do that. And then of course the whiteboarding questions, these can be pretty stressful because they can be all over the place. Sometimes they're really easy. Sometimes they involve you having to know uh, a lot about algorithms and it's just kind of stressful because it's a way for interviewers to see where your technical ability is at. And it's also a way so they can see how you respond to difficult questions or stressful situations and how you problem solve through those things. So don't feel like you have to get the answer exactly right, but just be sure that you are explaining the answer in a way that you are expressing your thought process through the question because that is gonna be more important than just being silent through the whole thing and like figuring it out or getting it wrong and just like being quiet through the whole thing. Don't do that. Explain yourself every step of the way through and should be good. Two books that I want to recommend have been really helpful for me for programming interviews. And the first one is Cracking the Coding Interview by Gail McDowell. This one is really good for understanding what companies are looking for. This covers in the first pages, like how to interview for Microsoft, Amazon, Facebook. And then further through the book, it goes over like problems, like here is arrays and strings threads and locks. There's a whole chapter dedicated to testing and sorting and searching. So some of these common algorithms that you may get questions on. And the next book is Elements of Programming Interviews in Java. And this is by Adin Aziz, Tungsten Hayes Lee, and Amit Prakash. I hope I'm pronouncing those right, probably not, but this is just a bunch of problems that are coded in Java that you might typically see on an interview. And see here, it goes over like time complexity and big O, which is one that is a tricky one that you might get asked. Um, there's also stuff on 2D arrays, uh, trees, binary trees and coding just lots of good stuff. So these are the two books that I recommend to help you out with interviews. Reason number two, there is lots of responsibility involved with being a software engineer. First off, there is almost zero downtime when you're working. There is no slow days, there's no fast days, there's no like, not lots of customers, lots of customers. It's like 100% all the time because it's a product driven profession. So you're constantly working on the product and this kind of 100%ing all the time can lead to some unhealthy habits in engineers. So it's important that you're getting enough sleep, that you're not constantly consuming coffee and energy drinks, and you're keeping up with your physical health by working out, and you're keeping up with your mental health by taking breaks. The on-call work is also a very real thing. So you might be coding for your eight hours a day, and then on your weekends, you could get a call that a production system was down or that there's like some kind of supporting maintenance that needs to happen and you have to be on call for that work. So there is an on call aspect of programming. You also might coordinate with your team on like rotations for on call. So you might do it on like a week by week or like a day by day basis, but keep in mind there is on call work. It is a very real thing. In addition, after hours work can happen. There might be times where you need to meet deadlines and don't be surprised if you are spending a lot of your night programming that otherwise you would be off because you have to meet a deadline. It's just 
a fact in reality of the job and sometimes you'll be working through lunch like you'll be eating and go having to be in a meeting or programming a solution because of a deadline deadlines are real and you have to meet them and you that time has to come from somewhere so be prepared for that also you're expected to know a vast amount of knowledge especially as you get more senior so at first starting out you'll probably be good like knowing one programming language barely knowing a certain niche of programming that the job is required of you at first but you know as you get more experience you'll learn more but as you get more senior be expected to know at least three languages and that's pretty easy to hit so if you're working on a full stack application and you're doing javascript and you're doing spring then that's already javascript and java right there so those are two very different languages that you'll have to know and then if you go to another project that might be using like i don't know like haskell or node.js or even python then you'll have to be expected to know that too as well as the old system so that if you ever get called to do work on the old system which can happen you'll you'll know how to work in there too and be proficient so you will have to be proficient in multiple languages multiple technology you'll have to know uh, a lot about architecture of your system and previous systems that you've worked on too so keep that in mind. I mentioned that there is a lot of coding. There is a lot of coding in software engineering, but it's not all coding. I feel like some people have this idea that being a software engineer is just like you sit down at your computer and you code all day, every day, and that's it. Like you're just in a dark room coding away, and that's not reality. Coding is only a small part of the job. The rest of the time is spent in meetings, either planning new features or talking about upcoming work in the next sprint or talking about work that has already happened and learning how to take experiences and build on them while also improving the product. And that takes a lot of team coordination and meetings and that is a big part of software engineering. So just be aware, it's not all coding. Also, there's a there's a testing part of it, which most of the time you're gonna be coding tests, but it's not like you're writing new functionality. You'll have to be writing tests around what you've already written. Along with that, there's also documentation. So for everything that you write, for every system or piece of the app that you write, you're gonna have to produce documentation on it. And the more you get familiar with this, the easier it's gonna be. It's painful at first, but just make templates and build upon those templates and you should be good. But just be aware there is a lot of documentation. And the other time is going to be spent either interviewing potential candidates. This is especially true when you're a more senior engineer or teaching a class, which typically you can teach a class to other engineers as you get more senior. And that's a, it's a really good opportunity for you. So I do recommend it, but just be aware it does take away from your time coding. Reason number three, before I get into reason number three, if you're watching this far, thank you so much. I really appreciate it. And if you wouldn't mind just leaving a like down below, thank you so much for watching. And now reason three is imposter syndrome. Imposter syndrome is a phenomenon where you don't feel like you're part of the group or you feel like you're undeserving of being part of this group. And this can happen a lot in software engineering because of the wide variety of engineers that you're gonna encounter. You're gonna encounter people who've been programming since they were like 10 years old and they just know everything about programming and they're the same age as you and you're gonna think, wow, I suck. But that's just you comparing yourself to them and it's not true. It's just they're further along in their career just because they've been doing it longer and there's nothing to say that you won't get there eventually, but it's just gonna take work and everyone is where they are and imposter syndrome is real and ju you'll just have to look out for it when you're experiencing those thoughts. And this can be a real issue because it can lead to unhealthy habits. Like it can lead you to work overtime when you don't really need to, like there's not really a deadline coming up, but you're just working overtime just because and it can also lead to lack in keeping up with your physical health. Like you might neglect exercising or going for a run or eating healthy. And these things are important. It can also lead you to a lot of caffeine abuse because you just want to go, go, go. You want to fill in those gaps that you perceive you have. So you're just like fueling yourself on caffeine all the time, which is super unhealthy. Don't do it. It's just not worth 
wrecking your body over that. Also, it can lead to problems with mental health. Like if you're constantly at 100% all the time and just working yourself into the ground, you're gonna get burnt out and you're gonna get stressed. And that is just not good for the longevity of you being a software engineer. Those are my three reasons why you shouldn't become a software engineer in 2021. And these are just my opinions, guys. So there's probably lots of other reasons why you shouldn't become a software engineer, but there's also lots of really good reasons why you should. And if you'd like to see my thoughts on those reasons why you should, be sure to check out my video that I did last week on this topic. You can find that video linked in the description. And without further ado, thank you guys so much for watching. I really appreciate it. If you liked the video, please leave a like. And if you wanna see more content like this or have an interest in software engineering, then consider subscribing. It's up to you. Thank you. Have a good day guys, and I will see y'all in the next one.